All right. Hello, everyone. How we doing? Beautiful day here in Pittsburgh. Kind of cloudy and rainy. Um, I think we're almost ready to start. I'll give it a second. Uh, not much happening here. Uh, I guess we're 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 almost done with the term though. That's a thing. That's an accomplishment. Second last class uh, to go. Um, and, what's up, Akib? How we doing? Um, I did not figure out when our. Let me figure out when our uh, exam is. What is it? The pit exam schedule. Final exams. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna be like a minute late here. I'm starting officially, starting class. Um, sprinter. We cannot. Okay, we're apparently not a class. Oh, I see. But so we're in the okay. We're not. We're not. We're not an exception. That's good. Uh, let's see, our class time start is Monday at 10, I guess that would be the, I mean, we're at 10.30, but I believe the rule is 10.30 counts as 10. Um, yeah, okay. So 10.30 counts as 10, Monday, April 20th. Okay, so I'm seeing April 20th at 10 a.m. Uh, to 11.50 is my official, um, which is a week, week from today. So, um, uh, yeah, so the case, right, I forgot, I did, I, I realized I didn't put a time. Yeah, case studies do it 11.59 tonight, all right, so I'll give you all day. Um, I just put up, yesterday, I put up the, the official Blackboard, uh, which I'm assuming that's where you saw the 11.59, so I put up the, uh, the official Blackboard assignment, so you just click on that, and then, like, upload, the file and that should that should work okay so um yeah you can just if you want to give me um any kind of docker pdf works for me um that's cool uh if you want to include the code that you use the fuse code or excel spreadsheets stuff like that you can do that so if you i mean if you do if you want to include everything you could do a zip file with some stuff in there if you want to just give me the doc with the final output that's fine too either way Okay. Um, all right. So then it's seen. Yeah. So it seems like uh, Monday, April twentieth at ten a.m. is our exam. Okay. And the um, the delivery method. I guess I can just put it on Blackboard. I need. I let me check to see how that works exactly. I mean, it should it should be just like putting up any document on Blackboard. Um, so that should be fine. And uh, yeah, if you, it'd be cool if, if anyone has an exam, you know, immediately before or after this exam, or if you are in a time zone that's like pretty far off continental US, um, let me know about that. That, that would be like useful information uh, to, to know how to plan this, okay? Um, yeah. All right, so, so that's the exam. Okay, um, that's going to be similar to the final, um, I guess. Yeah, and then it's going to be it's going to be open notes and book. All right, so you can use Jones and Bullrath. Yeah, Jones and Bullrath. You can use that. You can use uh, the notes online, everything like that. Okay. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it, and. Uh, Okay, okay, but I'm gonna look into the mechanics of, of submission and everything because that's something you don't want that to go wrong and that can um, can cause issues, technical issues. That's always a problem here. All right, um, I guess. Yeah, so I mean, one thing you can do is is make the give give you some extra you know some extra time like in addition to the official exam doing time, which is like you have like half an hour to like get everything together and and 
an email it or like maybe even an hour or something. So like, um, I need, I need to think about that, but I'll let you know next class, uh, what the, the ultimate decision there is. Okay. Um, all right. So then, um, yeah, if you, I mean, if you have any questions on your case studies, you know, let me know about that. Um, I hope the, the session last week was helpful and kind of giving you an idea of the, the general workflow. Okay. Um, looking forward to seeing what you guys discover. I'm kind of curious to know which countries you chose. Uh, so that should, that should be nice. Um, okay. So yeah, so, so today, uh, I guess the, so the plan for today is I want to go over some example problems. Okay. From the book. All right. I will, um, I'll put up some, I'll put up some practice problems, you know, cause like we don't really, I don't want to give you a, uh, an assignment a week before the exam. You should, but I do want you to be studying. So I'm going to put up some practice problems. Um, it'll, it'll be like as if it was a homework, but I'm going to give you the answers. Okay. Um, and you, and you don't have to like hand anything out. You can just, you know, I trust you're going to go over it and, and think about stuff. So, um, I'll, I'll put those up, uh, yeah, because I mean, with the week left, I don't think there's any time to do a a full full assignment. Okay, so we'll do that, and uh, and then I'll go over some practice problems today. Okay, so I once had a stylus pen. There we go. All right, so um, the problems that I'm thinking we should go over are from what we've been doing, chapter five in Jones Volrath. Okay, um, I guess I'll do numbers one and two in the in the book. Okay, so I'll, I'll say what what I'm doing, okay, in case you guys don't have the book handy or you have like a different edition or something, okay? Um, all right, so then, so exercise one, all right, in chapter five, page 139 in the book, if you're following along at home. So so that basically asks, uh, well, the, the title is an increase in the productivity of research. I can't remember if I did this before, but it's good to go over. Uh, suppose there's a one-time increase in the productivity of research represented by an increase in theta, okay? Um, in figure 5.1, we'll get there. Uh, what happens to the growth rate and the level of technology over time? Okay, so this is sort of a pretty classic problem uh, that we could we can consider. Okay, so let's let's do it. All right, so first we're gonna head on over to the whiteboard so you guys can see what I'm doing. See, I'm getting better with that. Um, so this is uh, problem 5.1 in uh, Jones Volrath. Okay. Handwriting, not so much. Okay. Um, all right. So, so this is basically asking what happens when you increase that productivity of research. Okay. So remember we got this, this is how Jones writes it. He writes theta, uh, a to the phi r to the theta, if I recall correctly. And he's referencing figure 5.1. Okay. So figure 5.1 is, uh, that's on page 109. Okay. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with the Jones notation. I think he he uses a lambda. I don't know. We've been using eta. Let's just do eta. Okay. So let's let's do this. Um, okay. So so this is our uh, production function for ideas. Okay. You got this constant productivity of research, how it builds on old ideas, and how it builds on actual research inputs. Okay. Um, all right. And so the question is, what happens? If, if you all of a sudden theta goes up, all right, so you get better at research. Um, you know, they invent the internet and all of a sudden you can see what everyone else is doing. You can collaborate better or something like that. Okay. Um, all right. So, so, you know, the kind of, the, we're going to go through sort of the standard steps that we always go through. So the first is to think about this in terms of, of growth rates of, of technology A. All right. So then, you know, there we're going to get theta on, on R A to the five minus one. Uh, and r to the eta. Okay, that's eta. All right, and then uh, we can rewrite that if we move. Since phi is less than one, it makes more sense to put it in the denominator. So this is going to be r to the eta over a now to the one minus phi. Okay, so we just move that downstairs. All right. Okay, and here we see, you know, r goes up, but a is going up too because technology is it's getting harder to make new technology, and and when these things balance is when we're in steady state. Okay. So when the when the, the growth rate of this top thing equals the growth rate of this bottom thing, that's when we're in steady state. Okay. 
And the reason I'm, I'm solving for steady state here again is, uh, it's not equal to, but the reason I'm solving for it is we, where that's where we're going to kind of start. And then we're going to think about what happens when you deviate from that. Okay. So in steady state, growth rate of that top thing is basically eta times how fast is R growing? Well, let's just say that's growing at the rate of population growth. So there's fixed fraction of researchers. And then the bottom is growing at rate one minus phi times there's G. So it's eta times the growth rate of R, which we're going to say is N, and then one minus phi times the growth rate of A, which is G. Okay, so that means that in steady state, you know, G star, we'll call it, is eta N for one minus phi. Maybe not the best idea to use eta and N right next to each other, but we're kind of stuck with it now. Eta's got the long tail. All right, so that's our that's our steady state growth rate. Okay, and so then figure 5.1 is, let me just double check that this, it's a growth rate picture, okay? Um, in the, yeah, so, okay. Yeah, so, so figure 5.1, so the idea is kind of, so like, okay, so this is our steady state growth rate. In general, right, just, I'm just rewriting this equation here. The growth rate is this thing here. It's theta r to the eta over a to the one minus phi. So if you woke up one day and you saw, oh, a is, has some value, 100 million for, or let's just say 10. It has some value 10 and you're going to put in a certain amount of r in terms of research, okay, and then, you know, we can also expand this and say that this is equal to uh, theta times, you know, some SR research fraction times the population. So, like, R is the research fraction times the total population over A to the 1 minus 5. So, you wake up, there's some A value for technology 10, population is 100, say, and then you know that you're going to, 10% of people are researcher, researchers, okay, and so you can calculate the growth rate on any given day. And then you update, you update A, you update population, and then the next day you can calculate it again, all right? So it's, it's kind of like a Malthusian diagram, okay? And so the way that, I'll write it over here. So the way that um, Jones portrays this is, you know, essentially, uh, I mean, Yes, you know it's kind of a weird graph in a way. He's just plotting growth as a function of like this ratio. So basically, he's plotting growth as a function of this L to the eta over a to the one minus phi ratio. Okay. Oops. All right. So any given day you wake up, you can calculate this. Okay. And then on the the x axis, he's he's plotting you know a dot over a which is G. He's plotting this on the x on the y-axis, sorry. Okay, and so there's, so essentially like if that thing is zero, okay, then it's at zero, okay, and then it just goes up linearly. All right, so it's not an identity line, but it's a linear line and the slope is like theta times SR to the eta, just whatever these constants are, okay? So if you, you have no population, you do no research, you ain't, you're not going anywhere. More population, this thing goes up, but also it's important the level of research because that controls how difficult it is to go to that next step of technology. Okay, so so that ratio is really what's important. So that's what he's plotting, and then he's got um, some this G star. Okay, right. So when this um, when this thing when the growth rate equals G star, okay, then we're gonna kind of that's where like kind of by definition where we where we stick around okay so like so so then there's going to be some intersection point here okay and then this is like some critical ratio right so um like you know so if we call it let's say we call this q okay then g is equal to well, it's basically theta sr to the eta times that q ratio or you could call it a quotient since it is a quotient, okay? So um, so that that's what this thing is plotting, is Q, and how does that map into G, okay? And then, um, you know, this so this would be like Q star. So that, that 
that q star would, would be just if you take this equation and put stars on it. OK. Well, that, that seems a little bit silly, but we also know that g star is equal to eta times n over 1 minus phi. OK, so that means that, that like, you know, if you want to solve for that intersection point where q star is equal to g star, then it's going to be like, you know, you just solve to these, you get like 1 over theta sr to the eta times eta n over 1 minus phi. OK, so you get some, like, ratio. And so, so what this is, basically what this is saying, OK, is intuitively i mean the, the the expression for it itself is not very intuitive i mean it's just a bunch of symbols jumping around okay it's not intuitive to me either okay but basically um you know the the, the this is like the normalized potential for growth you know so you you have more people and researchers relative to to how difficult technology is to advance right that that's the the, the relative notion here is the people to difficulty all right so more people this goes up more difficulty, it goes down. Okay, but then that quotient gives you this relationship. Okay, so um, all right. So now let's think about um, uh, what happens. Okay, if you change theta. Okay. If you change, so that's gonna basically show up here. Okay. It's going to show up here. So that, remember, this is what we're plotting. G. How does Q influence G? Okay. So then the slope of this line is still influenced by theta. Okay. So if we increase theta, okay, it's going to go like that. Okay. But for, first, let me let me talk about what happens. How do you converge to steady state? All right. So you wake up one day, and you got a lot of researchers and technology is is relatively unadvanced okay so then this this ratio is high right you're you're above q star you have a lot of researchers and you know, say a is low you're, you're you haven't even invented like i don't know the solar panel okay and all of a sudden you wake up and you got a bunch of brilliant researchers and they're like let's invent the solar panel okay so what happens well you're going to do you're going to have a lot of growth okay because you got a lot of easy stuff to to pick off right um so you're going to you're going to have see high g right you're going to be up here you're going to see g that's su super normal okay it's it's above normal uh and this, so you're going to have high growth now if you have high growth that's above this um basically above g star above this or you're above q star then this thing is going to go down over time because the definition of q, of q star and g star is where this thing is constant okay because of this intersection um now so, so if you have really good growth, then A is going to go up a lot. So it's actually Q is going to go down. Okay, so you're going to go down, right? So, but you're still going to be relatively high in the Q dimension. So you'll still see Q going down. And you're going to keep getting that above normal growth rate until you eventually push A up so high that Q returns to Q star and uh, growth is G star. Okay, so so it's kind of like in Malthus. But, you know, you start you start up here. You're kind of behind the ball on technology, but that means it's it's easier, and so you do a lot of investment in research. But then technology gets more and more difficult, and eventually it comes back to this sort of balancing point. Okay, same thing here. You're like you sort of like too advanced, and you you've done a lot of research. Okay, and now things are getting really difficult. Like you think about, I don't know what one example is like with the um, microprocessors. They have these different uh, mm, sizes. For uh, like the, the the kind of like the the smallest size that they can manipulate, it's like you know ten nanometers, seven nanometers, whatever, and they keep pushing that. But then at some point, they can't go any farther because of like quantum mechanics. Um, yeah, so convergence depends on a changing. So it's it's a little confusing because we're like we're looking at this Q ratio. Basically, Q Q changes um, when L and A change. Okay, so if, if you want to think about it like. You can think about it like the growth rate of Q. Okay, I don't know if this is going to help, but the growth rate of Q is going to be eta 
times n. Okay, so eta times n minus 1 minus phi times g. Okay, and so, you know, this thing is, when this thing is 0, when q isn't moving around, then you get exactly this. You get g star, okay? Um, and so, and when q is too high, right, then g is going to be high. All right, and this will this will equilibrate. But yeah, so, so basically, when, when you're up here and uh, you're high for high on high in terms of Q level, meaning technology is relatively low because it's a, it's a one over a kind of thing. Um, you're going to have a lot of growth because your technology is sort of relatively easy. Okay. And then that's going to push a up, which is going to push Q down and eventually you return here. Okay. Um, that's, that's, that's the basic logic. And then you just kind of invert that logic when you have relatively low levels of technology. Okay. So or, uh, sorry, high levels of technology. Okay. So here it's like you've gone, uh, as far as you can, you've, you've made like the six nanometer microprocessor. And then like after that, like quantum mechanics doesn't allow you to go any further. Right. So, so you have to kind of give up on that or at least come up with some radically new technology. Right. So then it's pretty difficult to do research. You're going to have low growth in a, and, uh, and so then that means Q actually is going to go up. Okay. Cause you're going to be putting more and more researchers out there too. Right. Uh, and so you're going to eventually equilibrate to this Q star and G star. Okay, so that's the basic logic. Okay, and the for convergence. Okay, just kind of like you, you, you just wake up one day and you want to figure out how the world, the world's gonna evolve. Okay, um, now let's do this. Okay, now the actual question. The question says, what happens if theta increases? Okay, so this is like, oops, this is theta. You know, this is like the original theta, theta zero. Okay. And then this is what happens if you have theta one. So here, uh, this that slope, remember, is this thing right here, theta sr to the eta, the slope of that line. So it, if theta changes, you, you're going to see an increase. If if sr changes, it, it'd be the same thing. Okay, if, regardless of whether theta or sr changes, it's going to look like some increase in sort of the effectiveness or productivity or quantity of research. Okay, so now. Usually with these things, these kind of questions, it's like you're in steady state already, and then you say, okay, let's perturb ourselves from steady state and see how we come back, all right, if we come back, which we will. Okay, so so what happens is we're, we're going, we're humming along in steady state, we're at Q star, we're at G star, everything's fine, and all of a sudden, uh, we jump up here. Okay, so we're going to jump. So the thing about Q is that it, in the short run, it kind of it kind of stays where it is, right? So today, it's like there's a certain amount of level of technology, there's a certain number of people, and hence researchers. So there's a certain Q today, and we can change Q tomorrow, but we're stuck with the Q for today, okay? So if that's true, when theta changes, we just jump straight up, okay? So we're going to jump straight up to this new value, okay? And now from the perspective of this, so now this new line is sort of how the world works, okay? The old world's gone. The only thing we inherit from the old world was that, that level of Q, okay? But the new rules of the world are operating according to this line and basically this G star. Okay, so now what does that mean? Well, that means all of a sudden we're, we're actually kind of, we're under teched, okay? And that makes sense because we have the same number of researchers, but all of a sudden our research productivity went way up, okay? So some, something about the research process just got much better. And so the like invention of the internet and World Wide Web would be an example, or like Wikipedia, something about the research process got better. Okay, so um, now all of a sudden research is kind of easier, and so we're going to get super normal growth, okay? And so we're going to grow a lot, but then that same logic of, you know, well, if you grow a lot, then Q goes down because then in the future, technology is harder to improve. Okay. That's going to slowly happen over time. Okay. This might take a while. This might take like a decade or something. So over time or even more. So you're going to move down and eventually you move back. So you always move back to G star. Okay. Because remember theta doesn't show up in this, in, in, in like what G, where is G star? G star, this is not a function of theta. All right, so you have to return to this point um, if, they, if, if none of these things change, right? So none of eta, n, or phi changed. So you have to return back to G star. This thing is the same. Uh, but in the short run, you have sort of a period of, of excess growth, and then that gets dissipated away down to G. Okay, so, so that's the basic logic in terms of growth. Okay, let me just double check what this is asking. Hold on, chapter. Um, so it's so it's asking what happens to the growth rate. Okay, so I think we've kind of said okay, it's going to go up. 
and then for some time and then it'll get dissipated back down okay so in terms of you know it's going to look pretty standard kind of stuff that we've seen before so this impulse and then decay all right so we're going to have uh you know this is g star okay we're going along and this is like time zero that's when the thing happens okay so for you know we're going along at g star boom the thing happens okay so we're going to jump up and then this decay back to g star okay, so let's say that that's like the same level okay so um this is time this is growth okay so you're going to get jump up and then you decay back down to your original level okay so um yeah, that's pretty standard. We see that kind of shape all the time in, in a variety of models. Okay. Uh, you can, and also, I mean, you, you know, you can see exactly what the, this, let's call this G1, that, that initial sort of the highest level of growth you achieve. Uh, so what's it going to be? What's well, it's just going to be like the original. So, so you can see here Q kind of the day that it happens. Okay. is going to be the same. This SR is going to be the same. It's just that theta jumps up. Right, so so G one is just going to be theta one over theta zero, zero, times that initial G, which is G star. So it's just going to go up by a factor of whatever theta increased by. Okay, and if you want to plug it in, so it's theta one over theta zero times that initial G star, which we actually know is eta n over one minus phi. Okay, so so that'll be we know exactly kind of what this new growth rate is if we know these thetas and everything. Okay, um, and then it eventually decays back down to to g star okay um okay now the levels uh levels can be tricky all right okay but we can do that um actually okay so let's let's think about levels of of technology all right so to do that we can actually just use this equation here okay because if we're if we're going along in steady state, okay, at um, G star, okay, well, we know what the population is, okay, and uh, we know what the, the research fraction is. We can observe that. We let's say we know what theta is and, and eta and all these parameters. Let's say we know those, okay. Then we can solve for a, okay, because a is a is endogenous in some sense. I mean, a evolves according to this this law of motion where it builds on old technology and everything like that so a, a is endogenous so so i mean but so what we should really say is okay we know that g star is equal to theta um i'll write it as sr l to the eta over a to the one minus phi okay and then we also know that g star is eta n over one minus phi okay so, so we can solve. Get out here more. We can solve for a. Okay, so that means what? Well, first, okay, so it means that a. If we kind of rearrange these fractions, a to one minus phi is going to be. You know, it'll be. So we got this stuff on the right, theta s r, l to the eta, and then just moving this stuff over. We're going to get one minus phi over eta n. Okay. Um, and then we can even solve for a kind of explicitly okay it ain't pretty but it's it's an equation these are getting increasingly elaborate and fanciful okay so uh this is our equation all right we can solve exactly for what a is okay now this this is true like once you've reached steady state so maybe we'll call it like a star but it's it's actually a function of t okay because L continually grows over time. So A continually grows over time because L does, right? And you can see that if L is growing at rate N, we have an eta factor here and a one minus phi factor here. So this thing will grow at N eta over one minus phi, which is exactly G star, which is which is not coincidental. It's, you know, the, the, that's the steady state growth rate. And you can see that in this equation. Okay, so this is... Let me, let me rewrite this so we can see that actually this a of t calling this a like a star of t here okay and then this this l is a function of t as well okay so um that that's how the levels work okay so it's 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 you know it's not as clean as just writing out the growth rate but the you know you can you can actually solve for the levels okay now 
um what we can see is the following yep remember so the, because this is true in steady state it's not something that's always true at any given time it's sort of like after you've converged you know in terms of like growth rates here once you've reached g star or once you once you're way out here or before the change happens you know on either side but not in the middle then this thing is kind of true okay so so to which is to say we can figure out kind of where do we begin and where do we end where we go in the middle well you know usually you can kind of just interpolate right so we know that basically when you know bef the difference between the original theta zero and the new theta one you know is going to push that level up okay so um by a factor of like you know the the, the theta ratio but with this exponent okay so it's going to push it up sort of pseudo proportionally to, to how much theta increases okay so so that's the notion where it's you always return back to the same growth rate when you change this theta but you do actually you increase the level of output Okay, because your, your research gets more productive, you do more research, that pushes the level up, but because it, pushing the level up makes research in the future more difficult, that's what makes your growth rate return to normal, but you still have that, that sort of level. Okay, so the idea would be like, you know, you were going along like this. Now this is, remember, we do things in logs here, so this is log A, this is time. So you run along, and then all of a sudden this theta productivity shock happens, Here's what thing the world would have looked like if theta never changed. That's the just extrapolating that, but theta did change, okay? So in fact, we're gonna do something like this. And then we're the only thing we need to make sure of is that this slope is equal to both what we started with originally and the extrapolation here of sort of what if nothing ever changed uh, scenario. Uh, so, but we're gonna have this period where the slope is higher by a little bit and we create this level. So this level now is some permanent difference between the output of the, the the new world and the what the counterfactual old world, okay, that's that's how these things work um, in these models where you have to end up at the same growth rate in the end, okay. Now, um, what is this? Okay, so you can ask what is what what happens in the middle exactly. Uh, you you can even you can do that. All right, so you can say, um, so we know that, so we've rewritten this equation like three times, but like nonetheless, we know that this is the growth rate. Okay. I mean, we can, so, you know, we can just, if we had a computer and we knew, you know, what was A at this point, T0, okay. What did, how did theta change? Okay. How did, uh, note that also that there's no discontinuity here because theta changes the growth rate of A, but it doesn't change the level of A. The level of A has to change slowly over time because it takes research. So, um, but if you think about the growth rate, okay, so that's gonna, uh, in the immediate sense, as we saw before, right, that's gonna jump up here, okay, and then converge back down, okay. Um, if, if you want, you can take the growth rate of this equation, okay? So you got the growth rate of G, growth rate of the growth rate is going to be, you know, eta times N minus 1 minus phi times G. Sorry, this is phi. Okay, so phi. That's a wonky phi. We need better. Okay, so, so you can do this. All right, so now you can say, okay, well, we know... We start at G, the slope for here, remember, is G. The slope of this line is G. We know we start at G star. And then all of a sudden, um, there's a change, okay? G goes up by a factor of theta one over theta zero, basically this this, this graph, okay? And then this differential equation will, will tell us how exactly we return to normal, okay? So what, I guess what I'm saying is, I mean, you could, you could do it. You could calculate exactly what this path looks like in a computer. And then to get to this, well, this is actually just the integral of g right so so d dt of log a is a dot over a which is g okay so you just take this graph and integrate it and you're going to get exactly this graph okay this level change here 
is the cumulative amount of excess growth that you had. Okay. You can see that the slopes are the same equal to G star at the beginning and the end, which we see here. Okay. So it's just, you just, just integrate this graph to get this graph. All right. That's conceptually, you know, what you do. And if you had a computer, you would do that too, basically. All right. Um, Okay, so that's that's kind of you know the whole story I think on what happens if you have one of these one time change one time increases in productivity, all right. And if you had a change in SR, essentially everything I just said would be the same, with some minor modifications about what exactly these ratios look like, okay. Uh, but but functionally it would look very similar, okay. Um, okay, so that's that's exercise number one. That's five point one, okay. Um, we can, we can also do 5.2. Okay. So 5.2 is kind of interesting. And I think, um, it has, I guess it sort of, it sort of forces us to, uh, sort out some things that maybe we hadn't sorted out fully before. Okay. So, um, and it also relates back to something that we talked about a while ago. Uh, in the, the solo model setup of, of the golden rule growth rate, where we thought about what's the savings rate that op, that maximizes um, steady state uh, consumption. Okay, so we, we thought about given the fact that the savings rate increases steady state amount of capital, but then if you save more, you're you're consuming less of the output of that capital. So that's sort of like a non obvious interior solution. And we found that that actually the savings rate was equal to just that alpha parameter on the production function, the, the golden rule savings rate. We can do something similar for SR because, because SR, kind of as, as we saw here a little bit, SR in the same way that theta will determines the level, that level of growth. Okay. So like, um, you know, think about here, SR determines the level of A star of T. Okay. Even though there's other, even though L and everything is growing over time, sort of the level of SR determines the level of AT. Okay. Um, but if you have more people doing research, you got less people doing like real, what we'll call real production of, of you know, goods today. Um, and, and we need, you know, they're both important. And so you'll have a higher level of technology and hence more output. But or, yes, yeah, so you have a high level of technology, but then you have less people using that technology, right? So you have to, to use the technology, really, you have to be a production worker. So it's the same kind of thing is that, you know, you, you have this non, sort of, you know, two forces competing sort of non-obvious interior solution probably is going to be the answer, okay? You're not going to go all the way in one or the other direction, okay? So, so that's kind of what we're getting at here, okay? So the question says, too much of a good thing, um, consider the level of per capita income along a balanced growth path given by equation 5.11, which, what is 5.11? 5.11 is a big ugly equation. We're going to derive that anyway, so it's not a big deal. Okay. Um, so consider that thing that we're going to derive, the, the output, basically. Okay. Um, and find the value for SR that maximizes output per worker along a balanced growth path for this example. Why is it possible to do too much R and D according to this criterion. Okay, so that's that's the basic idea. All right, so what we're going to do, we're going to derive equation five eleven, and then once we derive equation five eleven, essentially the answer is going to be pretty straightforward. Okay, so um, yeah. All right, so so what do we need to do that? We need to kind of remember some old stuff. Remembering things is, in general, for me, difficult, uh, but we're going to do it. Okay, so let me. Let me make sure that I have all the right equations here. Yeah, I think we got it. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna need to remember some stuff from solo, okay? Because it's easy to forget here, but there's basically a solo model operating in the background, right? Because remember, this is this is still Roman model. So remember, Roman model, you, you have expanding um, technology, which is like the variety of the a, the number of different goods, okay? But um but you need capital to make those goods and there's capital investment going on in the background. Okay. So, so just to refresh, remember we have, um, so I guess I'm going to use, do it a little bit differently from Jones. I'm going to say 
you have production labor, you have research labor, and that all adds up to L, which is like population, total labor, okay? Okay, so then um, in that setting, then output, basically you, you use some production labor, you've got A different sort of factories going, right, uh, J, and they each produce X, J, sort of varieties, okay? Raise those babies to the alpha, integrate, okay? That's, um, that's, I mean, that's, that's the assumption. That's our original Romer production function. But that's what, what basically, except, so Jones uses, would, would here would use L sub Y. Jones uses L sub, I believe L sub Y and L sub R, or a, maybe A is equal to total L. Maybe he's better, maybe his notation is better, but I've, I've been using this, so I'm gonna stick with this. So just make sure you remember P is not a price, okay? It's capital P. So, um, uh, yeah, so what, so what do we know? So we, we actually, remember we found that in the end, you're just going to take all your capital that you have piled up K, split it between all your different A product lines and use, use that for production. So XJ is just sort of take all the capital, divide by the number of, of factories and in each factory gets K over A. Okay. Um, so then this is going to be P the one minus alpha, basically this integral then is just a, you're going to go from zero to a times a constant, which is k over a to the alpha. Okay. And this is where you get sort of that, re that return to what we saw before. So you, here you're going to get, you're going to have a k to the alpha term. Okay. You're going to have a p to the one minus alpha, and you're also going to have an a to the one minus alpha. So you're going to get a p to one minus alpha. Okay, uh, and you know, usually when we would just use L, this would be K out to the alpha, A L to one minus alpha. Now we have P because it's production, but it's the same basic idea, is that this return, this this ends up being kind of equivalent to the production function that we used in the days of old in the solo era. Okay, um, okay, and then the other thing to remember that that solo is happening in the background, in the sense that uh, you've got you you have some investment rate, so let's call it SK uh, times Y minus delta K, that you have this solo capital accumulation happening in, in the background as well, just because like you need capital, all right? So so there's two investment rates, basically. There's, there's SK, the capital investment rate, and then there's like the research investment rate, SR. That's the idea, okay? So, and when we found the golden rule before, we found SK that maximized steady state consumption. Now we're gonna find the SR that maximizes steady state output or consumption really. Okay, so that's that's what we're gonna do. Um, so let's do that. Um, now, hmm. okay, so now there's kind of, well, there's a couple things we need to do. Let me make sure I get this right. There's a couple things we need to do. Um, we need to know what's going on with capital, and we need to know what's going on with technology, basically, if we want to figure out what's going on with output. Okay. Um, so let's do that. All right. So so I guess. Yeah. Um, let's do that. Okay. So, so the, I think the best way to do this, to, to approach this, okay, is think about y over al. So, so we're, we're fundamentally we're interested in. Um, we're interested in in output per capita. Okay, that's what it's asking about. It's actually asking, it's asking about y over L, which is y. Okay, which then in that, okay. Now, but remember when we had, when we did solo a while ago, 
we we divided not just by capital but by technology too to get some truly normalized number y tilde okay so we kind of need because a is growing technology is growing over time now endogenously we we want to start by normalizing like this and figure everything out and then we'll move into backing out actual y over l by just multiplying by a okay so um so what is it what's that going to give us so so here we can uh divide okay um yep so we can so let's okay so so this is going to be First, we're gonna we need to sort out what's going on with P and L. Okay, so bear with me. So we want to find this this normalized y. This is this is gonna be like a specific number in the end because uh, y is you know y is gonna be growing, but AL is gonna be growing, and we're gonna get that ratio. Okay, so think about y over AL. So first, we can break it up into by multiplying and dividing by P, we get y over AP times P over L, which is which is like the the amount of fraction of labor that you're putting into production relative to the total amount of labor. Okay, so now Y over AP, we can calculate. That's just going to be K over AP. So when you divide by AP here, you're going to get K to the alpha over AP to the alpha. So you get K over AP to the alpha. All right. And then you still have this p over l thing here. Okay, so now it's some some product of the ratio of capital to labor and technology. Okay, which is going to come from solo, and then this thing, which is just the the fraction of uh, labor that you're using for production. Okay, now. Um, We can get K over AP, all right, from Solo. Solo is going to give us that, okay. Um, and we'll see that, all right. Uh, <clears throat> this thing, P over L, that's that's just one minus SR, okay. It's just whatever you're not using for research, okay. So we're gonna we're gonna be able to know that, and then we're gonna know what's going on with A, okay. So, um, so we we need we need to do two things, okay? All right, and we're gonna do both. And we need to do them separately, okay? So I just want to like make clear how we're gonna proceed here, okay? So let me say, okay, so this is important, okay? This stuff all here is important, and we need to we need to branch off, okay? So one, we need to think about solo, okay? And then two, we need to think about kind of technology like a basically a and k okay then we're going to come back to this and and plug everything in okay it's like more hard than i it's more difficult than i remember but nonetheless um yeah so uh how should we proceed So what do we know from solo? Okay, so so from solo, we have this law of motion for capital. All right, this is basically this is the same thing we had before. Okay. Now if we divide by k, then we get sk y over k. So the growth rate of K, GK, is equal to K dot over K, which is SK times Y over K minus delta. Okay, so this is just dividing by K and then boom. Now, 
but we kind of know what the growth rate of K should be. All right, we, we did this in Solo a while back. Basically, you, you, you always find that the growth rate of, of K and Y and everything should just be uh, the growth rate of technology plus the growth rate of population. Okay, it's the same thing you have here. The output and capital and everything should be growing at the same rate as AL, which is the growth rate of technology plus the growth rate of population. Okay, so that's still true. Okay, and that's always going to basically be true in the setting. Okay, so then, so this is like, this is uh, G plus N. Okay, right? And given that, we can solve for, for Y over K. So we say Y over K is, you know, G plus N plus delta over SK. Okay. Um, all right, or, yep. Yeah. Okay, so then, or if you want, Maybe it's better to think about it as k over y, right? So k over y is sk over g plus n plus delta. Okay, that's a that's a g there. Okay, so that's like like the level of capital relative to output. Okay, is you know some increasing function of your investment in capital and these these depreciation terms. Okay, now we know what k over y is. Like, like we can calculate k over y here, all right? So let's, I don't know, the, this program insists on having this gray bar at a page break and I don't like it. So so we, we can we can figure out um, k over y. So, so like we know that y over k, let me just, so from, from up here, y is equal to k to the alpha, ap to the one minus alpha. Okay, so, for, so y over k, is k to the alpha minus one AP to the one minus alpha, which is AP over K to the one minus alpha, if you combine these, all right? And if you flip it over, you get K over Y is K over AP to the one minus alpha, okay? And that's exactly what we were looking for here, K over AP except we can, we can take care of the exponent, okay? All right, so then that means that k over ap to the alpha is, yep, I got that issue. Yep, thank you. Um, so we have k over ap, let me, I kind of went crazy with the parentheses. I guess the best way to say this is, you know, uh, just regular old k over ap. is k over y the one over one minus alpha which is we found is is this sk thing okay over delta plus n plus g the one over one minus alpha okay so that's that's k over ap okay so so sort of a, a long and arduous process but at the end of the day we figured out what this k over ap term is just from kind of solo related stuff. And it's essentially like some function of um, your, uh, your, it's some function of your investment rates and depreciation rates, okay? So it's something like the, the ratio of investment and depreciation. Okay, so um, yeah, actually this doesn't, this it's good to have this term, but it actually doesn't even matter for what we're doing here because it's not related to technology, but at least we found it. All right. So, so, um, there's sort of like, yeah, so all stuff. Okay. So now we can, we can actually kind of use all of this together and, and make some headway. All right. So let's, let's think about that Y tilde up there, all right? That Y tilde is, you know, eventually we found to be K over AP to the alpha times P over L. Okay, now remember the SR, that's RRL, that's the amount of researchers that you're uh, putting in um, divided by the population. Okay, um, and since L equals P plus R, that means that, you know, basically 
one minus SR. It's just that remainder, the remaining people that you're putting into production divided by labor. Okay. Or the, the sum of these two implies this equation. Okay. So, so P over L is just one minus SR. Okay. So that's good too. Cause we know, now we know that the, the and it's just, you know, anything you don't use for research use for production. Okay. So now we can combine them. We know, we know P over L, we know K over AP, we know it all. All right. So we're going to say this is SK over Delta plus N plus G to the one over one minus alpha times one minus SR. Okay. So it's pretty good. Now everything is lowercase. It's always good if things are lowercase in general. All right. Um, and now we see some glimmer of dependence on SR, which is the thing that we're actually interested in. Okay. Now there's one last thing, which is recall that this is Y over AL. Remember over here, we defined Y tilde as Y over AL. So we can move that A over. Okay. So we get, you know, Y over L is this whole thing. I'm going to write it as just like, you know, it's the same thing that that fraction there times one minus SR. Okay. Time, sorry, that that's just, I just botched that. First of all, this should be an L. Second of all, the A should be over here now. Okay. So the Y, just move this A over. Y over L, move the A over is this whole thing times A. Okay. And Y over L is also, we, we call that lowercase Y. That's output per capita. That's the thing we're interested in. Okay. So now we know output per capita is a solo term here. SK over delta plus G plus N to the one over one minus alpha. The production share, which is one minus SR times A. Now, what is A? Okay, that's that's a question, but that's a question we already know the answer to, actually. How does A depend on SR? We did that. We're there, right here. But when we backed out that level, okay, we implicitly said A star is some function of, you know, L and these parameters times S, but, but it includes SR here to the eta over one minus phi. Okay. Um, so that's, that's good. That makes our lives easier. Um, and we can incorporate that. All right. So let's do that. Um, it's a lot of stuff to write there. Okay. So, I mean, I don't want to write like a million different symbols. Okay. But here, here's, here's the, the takeaway. Okay. What's going to be important here? What factors are going to be important? Cause you can see that like, if we're interested in SR, this multiplying factor here is not going to change the equation. If we're maximizing over SR, the fact that we have some constant hanging out on front, doesn't matter what that constant is. As long as it doesn't depend on SR, which, which it doesn't, then it's not none of, our, none of our problem. Okay, so in terms of things that are SR relevant, we have a one minus SR. And to things that are SR relevant inside of this A expression, basically SR to the eta over one minus phi. Okay, so here we're gonna have SR to the eta over one minus phi. Okay, so that those are the, everything else is a constant or population that's growing, but, but in a, a known way. Okay. So in that sense, really all that matters is this. Okay. We, if we can maximize this, then we've maximized, uh, uh, out, output per person, Y over L lowercase Y over SR. Okay. Um, now in Jones, he actually, when he goes through this, he has, um, he uses phi equals zero and eta equals one, which is convenient because then this thing ends up just being one minus SR times SR. Okay. Which is maximized at a half, it turns out. Okay, exactly a half, it's symmetric. Okay. Um, I mean, we don't, but, but we can do it in the general case. We're, we're, we're beyond that, okay? So so let's do that, all right? So let's let's maximize this. Okay. Um, all right. So, so one thing you can always do is this is what we did when we, when we found the golden rule 
if you want to maximize something, so this is this is like f of sr. We're maximizing f of sr. Okay. If you want to maximize something, you can always take the log too. And maximize that because if you maximize if because the log is just some increasing function, if you maximize the log of a function, it's the same as maximizing the function itself. If there's a point that's higher than anywhere else in regular space, it's going to be higher than anywhere else in the log space. Okay, that's not true if the function is not just an increasing function, right? If if you max if you if you squared something, for instance. Because the square, you know, squaring something looks like this parabola kind of thing. That's going to screw up everything. Okay, you can't do that. But with log, it's just some increasing function. It's like multiplying by two, basically. Okay, so so we're free to do that, and that makes our lives easier too. So let's do that. So this gives you log of one minus sr plus eight over one minus phi log of sr. So here we've we've leaned heavily on the rules of logarithms, and one is splitting this up into a sum because it's a product. The other is bringing this exponent down. Okay, so we split up into this, these two terms here on the product, and then we bring this exponent down. Okay, so now we have a relatively simpler equ equation. Okay, and then here, take that derivative. Okay, so we're going to get, you know, minus 1 over 1 minus SR. So we get 1 over 1 minus SR, and then we have a minus 1 from the chain rule, and then we have. 8 over 1 minus 5 times uh, 1 over sr. Okay, times 1 over sr. So it's just like well, derivative of log is 1 over x, and that'll give us most of the way. Okay. All right, now. This is if we cross multiply, so to move this over here and cross multiply. Then we're going to get 8 over 1 minus phi times 1 minus sr is equal to sr. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then at that point, you can solve for sr. And then basically, you're going to get. Um, 8 over 1 minus phi over 1 plus 8 over 1 minus phi. Okay. So, I don't know. Maybe not the most intuitive equation in the world. I mean, you can, if you multiply by 1 minus phi, you get this. You get 8 over 1 minus phi plus 8. Okay. But, um, you know, another way to write it, or kind of interpret it is well th this eta over one minus phi. Remember g star is eta times n divided by one minus phi. So th this thing here, like here, is is you know it's it's g star over n star equals sr. Okay, so we could we could think about it like that. That sr then would be you know g star over n over one plus so over n. So like the ratio of like growth to population growth, or if you multiply through, it's going to be g star over uh, n plus g star. Okay, so there, you know, here you can see, the, the reason I guess this is a little better is that you can see that if you kind of to achieve a higher and higher G star, the, the larger G star is, the more research you have to do. Okay. Um, you know, if you had, if you had no growth, you wouldn't, you know, so you don't need any research to do zero growth. The more, the higher this growth rate gets, the more research you have to do. And this population growth, I guess, Higher population growth means less. So I, I guess like, you know, it's, you can go like this. If you have higher population growth, you got more people out there doing research you, that could potentially do research. So you don't actually need as high of a fractional research rate, right? You're just relying, you know, 
if, if your population growth rate doubles, you're going to have way and way more people. You can redu actually reduce the, the fraction of people and still probably get more growth. Okay. So, so that the idea is that you don't have to do the same amount of fractional, you know, fraction of research to get the same G star, the faster your population grows. Okay. So that's, that's the idea. Um, now, yeah, so, so I think probably this is the most intuitive expression. Okay. It gives you some relationship between G star and everything else. Right. So, um, now, now the, and remember this, this is the golden rule. So this is, this is like, whatever and we called it before hat or something as our hat this is the golden rule this this is if you want to maximize steady state output it's not clear that you want to do that because you'd have to be very very far sighted you know your time horizons essentially infinite okay you only care about what happens in that far future when you've created like the perfect society through research or something now um yeah and if you think about What is this growth? I mean, you know, our, our let's say our, our technological growth is like two percent, population growth is two percent. So th this would imply a half for SR. Fifty percent of people do research. That's kind of insane. Okay, that's a lot. Um, you know, it'd be cool if if you know if we didn't if fifty percent of people could be researchers or whatever artists or whatever. But um, that probably would result in certain problems of like, you know output and supply and things like that. So maybe sometime in the future, I don't know. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's a very high number if you plug in actual numbers for that. Okay. That's, that's one thing. Um, and also it's not clear that even we would want to do that because we actually are, we do have discount rates. We do care about the present, not just the future. Okay. So, um, same, same caveats that I, that I added basically when we talked about, uh, uh, the golden rule uh, savings rate for for solo model and capital. Okay, uh, anytime you have a, a discount rate, you're gonna you're gonna go below that. You would never want to go above this. Is the other cat the other sort of implication that was the same in solo? You're never gonna go above this because you are hurting yourself both in the short and the long run if you go above SR hat. Okay, so that would be a little wild. All right. Um, okay, so then I think that was. Let's go back to actually what the question was. The question was, yeah, so is it, pos yeah, is it possible to do too much R&D? Yes. And you just have to make sure to stay below a half, which should be relatively easy. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, the takeaways there are like, you know, from the Roma model, you can get, we got SR, right? Getting all the way back to some kind of, output like production observable like YRL per capita output it's pretty difficult actually because you need to first of all kind of bring back all of these solo results account kind of tweak solo a little bit so that you you divide by p right so you get the you know that you account for the fact that you're actually not using all of your labor for production okay and that it's you need to be just kind of careful about that um bring in all that investment stuff Right, and then finally you get the solo term. You get sort of a production fraction, and you get a, which is a whole other thing. So it, it's bringing together a bunch of different stuff from basically every part of the class into this one like ultimate equation, right? So um, to get the exact level. Now you know maybe you only care about growth rates, which is fine, and then that's relatively easy. But to get the level, you need to bring in everything else and, and combine it into one expression. Okay. Um, all right, so yeah, uh, that was that question. That was that was a lot. Okay, so I guess um, well, we did some practice questions. I think that's good. Um, just kind of get comfortable with with this stuff. I mean, I think I think this got a this got a little out of hand um, in some ways, but um, just because there are so many different things flying around and like factors to account for, but um, maybe, I think it, in some sense it gives you a, a full picture of, of, of what's happening here okay but usually we can we can kind of be a, a little bit more isolated and just say okay what's happening in this part of the model what's happening in for growth or things like that we don't have to bring everything together okay um all right so then yeah in terms of the other so we did we also we did question three last time or maybe two times ago 
uh, in in chapter five. And then ch question four relates to this question of monopolies and how do they do, you know, like monopolies generate some consumer surplus and they are able to extract some fraction of that consumer surplus. Um, but they don't extract all of it, okay? Which is good for consumers in the short run because why would you want to pay more for something when you can pay less for it? Um, and you they just can buy more. Um, good for consumers in the short run. Now, but if you think about the long run incentives, right? Kind of optimally, if you were setting research optimally, you would uh, do research until the marginal cost of doing that research was equal to the marginal societal benefit, which is to say the whole consumer surplus. Okay. So in some, there's a sense in which if you wanted to get optimal research out of firms, you would want to give them the whole surplus so that they s exactly uh, internalize those social benefits. Okay. Um, but the problem is you also kind of don't want to give them that surplus because you want to have the surplus as a consumer. Um, so there's a little bit of a double, it's, I don't know if it's called double marginalization, but you, you have two objectives and you can't, by definition, you can't hit them both. Okay. So, so th there's a sense in which you cannot have your cake and eat it too or whatever. Um, so, uh, and, and that is essentially, that's also kind of embodied in a patent system, right? We're in, we're in a patent system. You, you, you give the patent, right, which creates the monopoly, which is kind of bad in the short run, but then good in the long run because it creates incentives for actually doing research. Okay, so you basically, you face the same trade-off when you're, when you're deciding, do I have a patent system or not? Or you're deciding, do I make patent length five years or 10 years or 20 years or infinite? Things like that, you're making that same trade-off. Okay, Um yeah, and so that's that's an I don't know it's it's a tough question, and and especially nowadays in the past decade or two, it seems like we're seeing a lot of consolidation, okay, uh, in industry, especially in technological, highly technologically advanced industries, um, possibly because of things relating to patents, okay, um, so or maybe trade secrecy or something like that. So so you, you, something you want to worry about, okay, and it's something that could change over time. Uh, as well, okay. Um, that's for, that's for patents. I mean, I guess you could also think about copyright. So cop copyright uh, in the U.S. is very long. It's like eighty years or something. I, I I should know the number, but I don't quite know that. It's much 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 longer than patents, and it keeps getting extended. Sort of conveniently, when Disney's patents are about to run out, uh, copyrights are about to run out. Um, so so that but that's another area where it's like, you know. It would be great if you could get a book for free or a movie for free. Uh, but also, if you do that, then the person that made it is not getting paid, right? Um, and sometimes they're just a regular person. It's like you kind of feel bad for them. Other times, even if they're a corporation, you're not setting incentives correctly for creation of new content, okay? Which, you know, we need kind of need new content, I think. Um, so, so that's a, it's kind of analogous, okay? Thinking about the creation of content arts uh, in a, in a more kind of corporate sense, really, uh, uh, and copyright and how that influences things. Because there, just like with technology, things are cumulative. People either directly remix stuff or they're sort of inspired by by existing stuff and they kind of uh, change it and and uh, incorporate sort of the spirit of of that into their their work, right? So there's a highly cumulative endeavor, uh, just like technology. Okay. So you might think that those same types of, uh, concerns are, are relevant there. Okay. So, um, yeah. All right. So that, that's, I guess that's pretty much it for today. So next time we're going to think about more generally, actually it's the last class. I mean, I've, I'm going to look at kind of a more general approach to growth and, and figuring out kind of empirically how countries have, have grown and why they've grown and, and how you're able to determine sort of causality um, in that realm. Okay, so I'm going to talk about that um, next class. Okay, so that's it for today, though. Uh, and uh, I'll see you all on uh, Wednesday. Um, I'll chill out here in the chat for a bit. Um, if you got any questions on anything,
including the, uh, the case study, which is due tonight, 11.59 p.m. Uh, got any questions on that, just uh, let me know and I'll, I'll be sure to, to answer them. Okay, thanks. Okay, Ben's got a question on part three. I'm all ears. I mean, I'm all like eyes that can see you texting stuff. Oh, we got uh, historical uh, genie data starts in 2004 for country, which is Portugal. Uh, not sure how much it'll fit in historical kind of my country. Yeah, that's the only of this. Um, are you looking at the World Bank data there? Or, yeah. Um, Okay, 2004, interesting. Um, there is one other, there is one other database which from uh, this guy. Okay, so that's, yeah, all right. Um, oops, there, there's this guy, uh, Branko Milanovic. Um, he is somewhere in Spain, probably Barcelona. Uh, he may have other stuff there, so let me see. Portugal. I'm seeing, yeah. Yeah, interesting. They don't have a great. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me look at one thing here. Uh, this Milanovic data. Um, real quick. Uh, it's actually, it's even more than all the genies data set. Uh, it's got, um, it, it, so it goes a little bit deeper in the sense that it looks at, what is it? This it's this, it breaks every country into, uh, 10 income groups like deciles and then tells you the share of income in, in each of those. So if you remember we, we had, when we constructed the GD coefficient, we had that Lorenz curve. It kind of gives you the Lorenz curve and then the genie is the integral of that. So it's, it's like one step more detailed than that. Um, what is Portugal's country code? That's always a question. It can be found relatively easily in the Google. PRT, excellent. Um, so I'm seeing, okay, so <clears throat> 
for this. Uh, <clears throat> I'm seeing a 1989 observation, a 94, 98, 2005, and 2008. So this will give you, yeah, so this, this, this will tell you or you can you can you can get the share of income in in the ten deciles from this. So you could look at something like the share of income going to the top ten percent. That's like a pretty common metric for inequality. Okay, you could even calculate the Gini coefficient. That's a little more difficult, but you could look at the share of income going to the top ten percent. I think that would be a really good uh, metric, and you can get you can get it in eighty nine, ninety four, ninety eight, and two thousand five, and two thousand eight. So that's probably better, right? So I. Let me just, um, I'll just save the Portugal section for this um, and send that to you in like a little Excel spreadsheet, okay? Um, I could send other, if you want me to like send Spain too as like a point of reference, get the whole Iberian Peninsula going there. Uh, I could do that too, but I, I'm, yeah, so I'll just, I'll just save this uh, as Excel and, and, and send that to you, okay? I'll send that off in a bit. Okay. All right, cool. Have a good day too, Ben. Um, send in that right now. 